This is Writers on Film, the only podcast dedicated to books on cinema. Hello everybody and welcome to Writers on Film. My name is John Bleasdale. I am a writer and film critic and today I'm going to be talking to David Hughes. We're going to have an episode where we review a book rather than talk to an author of a book. Although David Hughes has of course written a wonderful series of books about the greatest films never made, the greatest science fiction films never made. And he's also written books about Stanley Kubrick and David Lynch. But today we're going to do a review of Meg Gardner and Michael Mann's Heat 2. If you are interested and you haven't had the opportunity already, you can also go back and listen to my interview with Meg Gardner a couple of episodes um, a couple of episodes ago, two or three episodes ago. Uh, but before you do any of that, please enjoy the conversation. I still remember little bits of uh, um, like David Essex as the artillery man and him showing him how much he does. Start a whole new world underground. <laughs> yeah. Not poetry and rubbish, science. <laughs> <laughs> oh bit. my God, seminal. I know. How did that become like, I don't know. There's, there's some, um, it's just some, some stuff that's like pop culture that people sneer at now. And I know you're not like this. So I love to see that, that you among critics are, are very honest about your influences, be they, you know, from high or, or low culture kind of thing. But I do think there's this like massive snobbishness among, among critics sometimes where they won't necessarily acknowledge that the first time their, you know, bl blood was chilled or something was, was probably Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds and not James Wales as Frankenstein or, or, you know, Bella Lugosi as Dracula or something. It's like, come on, guys. We all know it was Salem's Lot, Michael Jackson's thriller, you know? Yeah. And Threads, you know, Threads, that's that's fair. Yeah, fair yeah. Way, I think, you know. I mean, my mum and dad were always really into the um, the idea that we should, we, you know, it was like working class um, sort of autodidact kind of thing of like ragged trousered philanthropists. And when we got the video recorder, the first video they got out of the Shell Garage that was sort of renting the videos was the killing fields. And it was like, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, we're, we're 13 years old. Can we watch something a little bit more exciting? It's like oh, a little man. bit, not, not just more exciting, a little bit more um, appropriate. You know? Age appropriate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, my dad yeah. was, no, no, it's really important. You know about this. This is really, this is really, uh, you know, important that, that you, and it, I mean, he wasn't like self serious or anything like that. I mean, we'd go and he'd take me to Firefox as well. But um, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, they just occasionally get stuck on the idea that we should watch something important today. Yeah. Oh, the ragged trousered philanthropist. I I think about that often. Actually, they they just did a really nice graphic novel version of it. I don't know if you've I don't know if you've seen that, which is well worth picking up. It's absolutely gorgeous. No, and I... a real labour of love for someone, which is, uh, yeah, 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 worth, worth checking out. But um, yeah, I just love the idea of, of a shell garage that has like Jaws 2, Porky's Revenge and the Killing Fields. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I remember it had Bl Blind Fury with Rutger Howard. You remember? I, mean, oh, I don't Rutger... think I've ever seen that. Oh, I, 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 did, I watched it recently. I think it's quite a famous director as well. It's like Roger Donaldson or someone as a director. Right. Um, but I remember the tagline which was like as fast as a cheetah, uh, as fierce as a lion, as blind, blind as, as a bat. bat. <laughs> <laughs> so I stepped on the punchline there, but yeah, oh my God, that's an all timer. Yeah. And what... That sounds like it should have its tongue firmly in, in cheek, but from oh, that yeah. period, you never know, you're never sure whether, you know, that's just a bad copywriter, you know. It, it's fairly daft. I mean, it's not an out and out comedy, but it knows it's really daft. It's not, right. uh, you know. Um, I mean, Wanted Dead or Alive was another one where they they were just kind of selling him as this sort of like lead man and lead actor, and he didn't really ever fit in there. He was, yeah. You know, I mean, those those films are sort of enjoyable in themselves, but he never 
he never got out of the straight to video um yeah you know bucket when it came to you know leading a movie yeah he was pretty cool with that though i think i mean he was he was quite sort of um comfortable with 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 where he was in the sort of you know the movie star kind of pantheon you know he's always seemed very down to earth i i interviewed him a couple of times once on the set of split second I oh think. right was that any good Wait. um i don't i don't know if split second was any good but i mean it was a really you know good value interview right i, do, I will, don't put this in the recording but i do remember that um while I was into, I was interviewing Kim Cattrall on the same set, and and uh, she was in her trailer, and I was wait, so- wait, 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 wait. And that's why neither of us are ever allowed back to Pinewood Studios again. Banned, and rightly so. I'm surprised. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't get a longer sentence, frankly. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, enough about uh, um, your your uh, dirty experiences. By the way, that's another thing. Actually, Rutger Hauer, um, his real lead performance was as a pint of Guinness in all those Guinness adverts. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I'd totally forgotten about that. What was it about him that made them think, "Yep, it's an Irish brand. We definitely want Rutger Hauer to be our." Because he looked like a pint of Guinness. He had the yellow hair and the, the black yeah. coat, and he was long and tall, pint-shaped. Yeah. Not pint-sized, but, but you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, and he damn, said, that's clever. I mean, he said, it's, it isn't easy being a dolphin, and then didn't explain it. <laughs> and everyone was like, <laughs> what the fuck does oh, that mean? Man. What a present. Yeah, yeah. that guy. Incredible. He, uh, Ridley Scott didn't direct those or something stupid, did he? That sounds like it could be right up his street. A massive brand like Guinness hiring. Yeah, everything. yeah. You would you would sort of think that that. I mean, I remember it being even at the time people going, "This is a really innovative sort of advertising yeah. uh, campaign because it's not explaining itself, and you've got to kind of go. It's not easy to be a dolphin because dolphins can't drink Guinness. Is that the is that what we're supposed to be drawing? Yeah. The conclusion we're supposed to be drawing." Um, well, you know, you're still talking about it, like, f- however many years later, that is like 35, I guess, years later. That's pretty cool. I mean, that is the power of deep, deep advertising, isn't it? I still sometimes sing the Shake and Vac um, music r- around the house, even though I haven't heard that commercial for probably 40 years. It's like the Mancurian candidate, isn't it? If I say quick fit fitter, you'll probably be out of the house running down the street to murder yeah. the uh, the Indonesian prime minister or someone. Yeah, well, didn't um to all beef patties, lettuce, sauce, whatever it was, um, cheese, all in the sesame seed bun, didn't that become like a code word in that movie um, with, uh, gosh, who's the, uh, Dabney Coleman, and who was the young kid who was in that movie Cloak and Dagger? It's like an 80s movie with a real edge. It's kind of like one of those Hitchcockian kid thrillers, but actually has like real was um, jaggedness real, to it. Real jeopardy to mm. it. Yeah. And there was something about the code that the kid knew because he'd memorized that McDonald's ad or something like that. Maybe I've just made it up, but I'm sure it becomes like a key part of, again, like because the way that pop culture sort of seeps into to you so that you can't forget a certain sequence of words actually makes for the perfect password in a code situation, you know, because mm. your, your password is do the shake and vac and put the freshness back. You will never forget how to say or spell that or, you know, it's a pretty cool, pretty cool one. You know, yeah. except of course you have to have a number and a bloody symbol in it as well. So that ruins that. But, uh, uh, <laughs> but bastards. <laughs> That's the, but uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking of Equus as well, having um, uh, the, the, the young guy, is it, was it Colin, not Colin Firth? Peter Firth. Peter Firth, yeah, jumping up and shouting, you know, rig, uh, uh, juicy fruit gum or something and and sort of doing a, I was doing an interview with someone and we we got onto that talking about that. And who was it? It was a guy who did the Velvet Underground and um, documentary and Carol. He did Carol as well. Todd, Todd Haynes, is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. And we, we started talking about, he was having some gum. And I went, ah, Wrigley's gum. I haven't seen that for a while. And yeah, remember, and started doing the song because I remembered it from Equus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's it again, you know, back to the, the sort of the, the high and low of pop culture. And, you know, in a funny sort of way, I guess, um, you know, doing a, uh, doing a genre movie 
like a um, well, like a heat because I know we have to start talking about heat eventually um, is a little bit like your kind of I know obviously you know some some great great filmmakers Kubrick included have done like heist movies but it's almost like that that those directors know that they are not necessarily slumming it to be down with the with the genre films and there's something great about a titan like Michael Mann or Scorsese doing a, a genre movie isn't there there's something very thrilling about that particularly yeah I think it I think the thing as well is that a lot of these people don't I think it's much better if it's someone who comes from genre as well because I mean Scorsese started off doing boxcar Bertha and Michael Mann you know he's he's you know made his bones in mainly in TV doing things like cr crime story and and uh and Miami Vice and and so there's genre that you know they're 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 not sort of sort of gliding in with uh you know from from the upper ether of art cinema to to see what genre is like uh you know Kenneth Branagh directing Thor they're um they're kind of they're, they're they're already in the mud and they they're like yeah we we can do this but we now we have the resources to do it like in a way which is much grander yeah and not looking down on it either that's kind mm. of uh, that, that's what i'm thinking about the fact that they recognize that that you know cinema is kind of uh the, the genre obviously is is a huge part of cinema and not something that you can necessarily separate from the um, you know, from from the sort of the, the quote unquote higher art that it's all kind of in a blend. And and obviously, you know, when I kind of came up watching, um, you know, the the Friday night horror movie with my mom or whatever, you know, and the Sunday afternoon film, I didn't know whether these were um, art movies or, you know, don't know if the old dark house is, you know, made by a, a great director because you're not really paying attention to that sort of stuff yet. So you don't really know the difference between a, a German expressionist masterpiece and, and a, and a, an equivalent sort of American film from old Hollywood or something. It's just like, do you like it or don't you? And it's only later that you start to put those on sort of levels and I think if you come in at, uh, that way just as if you're a director who comes from from genre you don't necessarily see the difference between those um you know it's the same art form and what you're going for is is you know is it any good well it's funny that uh, right uh, early on in the conversation you were saying um you know James Way you use James Whale as an example of sort of like uh you know a, a uh, something that someone who's a bit snooty might sort of claim to be their first, mo you know, the first moment in the cinema. Um, whereas, I, you know, that kind of old Frankenstein film, I grew up with those kinds of movies being on the television in the background of other movies as kind of <laughs> look, look how, look how sort of crappy American culture is, or you yeah. know, look how fro this is some throwaway stuff. Which uh, maybe old, as you get older, you think, ah, oh, no, it's more probably more an affectionate tribute. But I was reading it in that way. Yeah, you know, like how far we've come because now we're we're, we're in a an 80s horror movie yeah, when now we're on, watching fright night yeah, on halloween <laughs> and they're watching this creaky old thing with boris karloff with his with his hands out and the bolts in his neck or whatever and yeah they are sort of you know the the context of that makes you think oh yeah they're kind of taking the piss out of this creaky old stuff but it's actually like oh my god this is the stuff that influenced me you know yeah, that's yeah. that's why i think i love um uh stephen king's dance macabre because he just basically talks about all the stuff and he doesn't know as no, as none of us really did it was just what was on at the cinema that week i i was just as li likely to go and see the wraith in 1986 as i was aliens you know and it's mm. only really when you get there and and you realize that one is sort of great and another one is something you buy on an arrow blu-ray ironically uh, you know sort of <laughs> arrow 35 Blu -ray. years later <laughs> there are so many blu-rays at the moment they're coming out that are so beautifully packaged and you're like oh yeah let's get the box set and it's just like yeah. oh my god this stuff's a bit shit this would be in the bar <laughs> bargain bucket at the supermarket you'd walk right past it you would you wouldn't give it a second glance well i've just uh i've just put out amazing <laughs> monsters uh, speaking oh, right. of creaky old rubbish, they're on on a nice shiny Blu-ray now. This is my uh, special limited slipcase edition of Mazes and Monsters on my little boutique label, Plumeria. And so this so, is sort um, of like the Dungeons and Dragons kind of. Yeah, exactly. This is the, the but it's the Dungeons and Dragons Satanic Panic kind of thing. So it's Tom Hanks' first leading role, and basically, um, 1982. 
And uh, yeah, it's basically a kid gets a little too deep into his game of Dungeons and Dragons and kind of, um, you know, uh, loses the, um, the, you know, the boundary between fantasy and reality blurs, but um, but they can't use Dungeons and Dragons. So it's called <laughs> Mazes and Monsters. <laughs> Which was- It's great. I have to send you, I have to send you a copy because it will be the nicest packaged rubbish that you've... <laughs> you've ever seen probably but i have a fondness for the for the movie because when i was into dungeons and dragons and movies there wasn't a lot going no. on so you know what well, i was like 14 when it came out or whatever and it's like you would watch anything that had any kind I remember, of i got excited by he-man i, I as a kid i right. was like oh he-man that's kind of dungeons and dragons yeah of course there wasn't a lot of it around so you had to take what you could get you know thank god for like conan but i was probably still a bit young to watch that then you know mm. Would have been allowed to see it at the cinema and video was just something that my rich friends had so you know it sounds like my mum watched mazes and monsters because she definitely had a satanic pa- you know i had to sort of hide my copies of white dwarf and and stuff oh my gosh yeah she was really because she's she was you know hardcore catholic and so she was like uh you know this isn't about god <laughs> you know he's, yeah. he's, god never invented any dragons and that's my irish accent right (laughs) (laughs) so let's yeah let's talk about heat too so what's your relationship with heat well yeah that's a good what's your sort of question well i mean i think my relationship with i my my relationship with heat is um i remember you saying that you had watched it and thought i am you know it's perfectly okay and then you realized like on perhaps a second watch that you kind of were, were a bit blown away i actually kind of thought you know, it's a really, there are great, great things in it. Um, and obviously a lot of actors that I, that I really like. And um, the, there's, uh, but, but I never really had that love for it that people do. And, and every time I go back and sort of try to see what, uh, why other people think it's such a giant, I, I feel like it's one of those films that has become sort of epic um, probably because of the size of its performances and its running time and its general sort of look, it's got that massive screen feel. Mm. But and and a, you know a great great cast and I guess you know the the, the Departed is another film that I, I I feel a little bit like this. But I just I can never it can never quite get, I can never quite get there. So I did feel a little bit like I loved it enough to and I loved Tom Noonan. I mean, anything that Tom Noonan is, I think he's just one of the, you know, the the, the greatest things in in screen. And so I, I would kind of, that's always been my sort of, the highlight of that film for me. Every time I think about going back to watch it, I always think, oh yeah, I'm going to see it. Obviously I know what I'm going to see, but the bit that I really love is, is, is Tom Noonan, who is really one of the, one of the greats. Um, and I, I've, always um been a little bit of a michael mann skeptic and so when he makes a film that isn't so great like public enemies or like you know ali or whatever you know even the ones that that other people love i'm always a bit like ah oh, you know the miami vice movie i know it has its fans but i just I can't can't you know get uh, get into it um so he's never really been that uh, that that strong a, a, a film for me, even though I know it's great. It's like great in a way that The Departed is great, not in the way that, you know, James Wales Frankenstein is great. No, I don't mean that. <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean? So I, I'm not yeah. quite there with it. And so, and yet when I heard that Heat 2 was coming out, the first thing that annoyed me is that the two wasn't in the same font as Heat. And I thought, God, if you can't get that right, how are you going to, you know? And also you know there, there aren't that many characters left alive at the end of heat that would make the sequel interesting so mm. i thought all that and then i thought leave it alone you know like mm. you, like you did when you when you interviewed meg gardner you sort of admitted the same thing and then i started reading it and the so then i had to you know i had to get it anyway because you've got to see what what's what's going on and then and there's obviously there's a big fashion for belated sequels at the moment um and some of them have worked great you know there's been some fantastic ones i mean th- this isn't recent but my god psycho 2 how how is that so good how mm. that's as perfect a, a belated sequel as you could ever hope to see so i'm always hopeful about them because of psycho 2 you know it's like incredible um so um when I, and then I started reading it. I didn't know Meg Gardner from A Hole in the Ground, you know, and I thought, oh, my God, this voice, you know, the voice feels like 
I'm watching a movie already. And when, and when they did a recap, open with a recap of what happened in Heat, and it was written so well, it was such a perfect pricey of the sort of basically the important stuff and leaving out the stuff that wasn't so important. I thought, holy shit, this might actually be good. I better like pay a bit, you know, I better put my prejudices aside a bit. And, and then, man, I just thought it was great. I mean, I read it in a week primarily because you were, you know, the pressure was on. To <laughs> yeah, exactly. While it was still current. I was cracking But then the I realised, you know, there's a reason why I've read it in a week, which is very, very fast for me, is actually because I can't stop going back to it, you know. Mm. So, um, yeah, very interesting. And and of course, when I realised that they got around the fact that, that Neil, you know, didn't survive um, the film... Uh, by doing a flashback beforehand, you have that instant sort of prequel feel as with, you know, Better Call Saul. Well, you know that they, these people survive. So because, you you know, it, it takes away a little of the jeopardy, but the writing is so sharp and precise and urgent. When you read a car chase on a page and it reads like you're watching it in a movie, it's like something else. And that can happen in scripts. Now, I haven't, I, to my knowledge read a Michael Mann script of a script that Michael Mann has, has made, but I can imagine that, you know, the way that it feels to, to do that, it has that same kind of urgency and immediacy that the, that the book has. So I think, you know, um, Meg Gardner with Michael's kind of guidance, however that relationship worked, has absolutely... Um, has created something that I is, is I guess what it's what get people get from reading Jack Reacher novels, mm. you know that sort of uh, that that urgency of of action and stuff, and and the added thrill of like Kelso turning up, of course, and you know there there being sort of flashbacks to. You didn't ask me what I thought of the book actually, but you, you just asked me what I thought of the the, the original Heat movie, but. Um, <laughs> I've, I've segued so uh you know perfect it, it, you yeah, do my but... you do my job for me man so that's <laughs> but but you were a fan as well weren't you I, I know yeah yeah I really liked it I did have some criticisms which you know when you're interviewing an author or a director you you kind of mm-hmm. I, I I'm never going to give people criticisms unless they ask for them it's just doesn't it's not like uh right. not like so there were a couple of things that I um but they were relatively minor, and I think I, I had the same thing as you that it, I I just I just wanted to steam through it, and I was listening to it on aud- uh, Audible, so Thanks. so it was that thing of like um, uh, sort of deciding to go for long walks, and it's okay, I'll go to the supermarket, I'll get the yes, shopping, you know. Exactly. I want to. I want to listen to more walks than he's ever got in the past. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy who did Pacino was amazing. Oh, I mean, so well, it's, it's the same guy, but when he did Pacino, how do you like that? He really did Pacino. Oh, great big ass! <laughs> so I got that southern, slightly New Orleans, Louisiana feel to him. That uh, yeah, but even Pacino when he was doing like subtle him. accents, like Anna has a very specific kind of um, international school. Oh, there's the international school thing. Again. Um, <laughs> international school, you know, raised in in uh, you know, sort of educated in London or yeah, the you know, LSE and yeah. But, but it was obviously the Al Pacino impression that was so good, but he wasn't doing an impression of Al Pacino. He was like, you know, just kind of channeling Pacino in a really good way. So I thought it was... Totally and it was the way, it's the way they got, I mean, they got his voice. They obviously, you know, uh, you know, with um, uh, Michael Mann writing the script as well, you've, you've, he, he's going to know how to write for, for Pacino and going to know how to write that character. But, yeah. But it, it felt like Meg had, had really was owning those characters and that yeah. you know when he walks in the room and you know he's putting people off with his sort of like uh, a little bit of the gene hackman thing from the french connection of you know have you ever picked your feet in Poughkeepsie? yeah you know, it's that sort of like <laughs> what do you do what do you know what do you hear what do you say <laughs> yeah that's a that's a cagney thing isn't it which i thought was very on brand as well for for, for vincent Hanna. There, there's a couple of lovely little I probably didn't get them all, but it, but it it did feel like there was a couple of nice little Easter eggs in there, which I which which sort of made me chuckle. But um, I mean, just that uh, that that combination of you know Michael Mann's kind of 
well, his whole thing, his whole sort of personality and, and uh, you know, his background and everything and, uh, and meeting Meg's much sort of, you know, softer side. And, and let's face it, I mean, there are some great female characters in Heat, but it's such a, it, it's such a masculine world and it's such a masculine movie that I wasn't um, prejudiced against, you know, this is what I was actually like celebrating in a way, the fact that there was a woman who was kind of steering some of the, uh, um, you know, some of these characters as well, because it just added a, it didn't add a, a, anything sort of softer necessarily to it, but it just gave a different dimension to the characters, I think, you know, but particularly uh, bringing out some of their vulnerabilities, which may have been there in the backstory of the characters that Michael knew but ne weren't necessarily on the screen because it's such a tough, they're, they're such sort of tough sons of bitches, you know, and, and obviously it's the women who bring out the softness in those characters in that movie and also in the novel. And um, I mean, I was less taken with some of the Paraguayan stuff. I wasn't really into the the, the developments of, of, um, of Chris's life as Jeff Bergman and you know that new relationship and that whole business thing I, I, I was like I sort of could have done without that whole thing and then maybe some of the contrivances that get him where he needs to be for the final act without any spoilers um it was that was all a little bit too much but the fact that I was as invested in the characters that were invented for this novel um, as I was in the ones that I knew from the movie, that that kind of says a lot. And I'll be honest with you, this is the weirdest thing. Um, I didn't think until I listened, until I finished the novel and I listened to your interview with with Meg, I didn't think of this ever being on screen. Mm. That's so mad, isn't it? Mm. The, the, mm. You know, surely the first thing you should think of is, oh, I wonder if they'll ever make this into a film. But I wasn't. And, and then I thought, oh, my God, yeah, actually... I suppose you could. You don't have Val Kilmer and you don't have, you know, this, that and the other. But yeah. I, I, I think this is a I think this is a calling card. I think this is a, this is a, a relatively cheap way of working through a script in public. Um, you, it pays for itself because you sell the book. So it's already it's already paid its own sort of development. Money. Yeah. Um, and then you have, and then you also have an audience. You already, you already have I, you know, IP recognition from the previous film, but you also have an audience that are like, want to see this particular story, not just yeah. I want to see these characters come back. I want to see this actual story. Yeah. Um, and there are some very, very, I mean, it's it's not a criticism at all, but some very obvious kind of set pieces that you think, wow. I mean, especially towards the end, and yeah. uh, you know. Um, there, there's a scene which I could just I can just picture how exactly how Michael a Michael Mann version of the film would look. And there's a, there's a scene in Mexico. There's I mean there's, there's a shit there's a shit ton of scenes where you're just yeah. going. I I would love to see this. And um, you know there's a scene relatively early on just so we don't don't get too spoilery where uh, um, Vincent Hanna is is staking is, is on the trail of a of the home invasion crew. And they kind of stalk, uh, stake them out in a house and ambush them essentially. And that scene is just so well written in terms of the that I can see exactly what is going on, what the geography is, what the you know, and it's as exciting as as watching it on on a on a in a film. You know, it's it's yeah. I'm really in there with the drama and stuff. And and um, when I think about it, I don't think about it as I, I picture it as though I have seen a film. And honestly, I don't do that with with novels that I've read. There's there's something, and, and I if people said, oh, that novel is like very cinematic or whatever, people say that about like I don't know Stephen King's The Stand or whatever. And I'm like, mm. I can't I can't picture it, you know. But this one, without even the 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 visual reference, I don't think I'm really referencing Pacino's Hannah um, that much, even with the voice in the audio book. You know, <laughs> it's more that it's just as you say, it's so. Um, it's sort of cinematically blocked, you, mm. geographically precise. You know where everything is. Like the 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 scene with um, on the 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 I don't know if it's the PCH. I can't, I can't remember where, where it is, but but on the on the mountain road or whatever. No, it's not. Uh, but but you know, it's on that sort of highway. And there's a scene that takes place where 
he just wants to go up and radio and and can't quite you know manage that but that again when i picture it now i'm picturing the geography of how the mountain range and how the car and how everything is sort of placed on the it's just amazing so yeah. a credit to to meg and and to michael i guess for having that story sort of rolling around it didn't feel like it was that you know there's a lot of killer not much filler and even the filler i kind of get i just wasn't that invested in that particular storyline but which you know ironically is 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 one of is, is the storyline of the main sort of surviving character you know years after the from the original crew you know yeah yeah I, when i asked meg about that in the in the previous uh previous podcast i it was uh, i i felt i maybe i'd put it a little bit it was in danger of being a slightly backhandedly rude question of saying did you ever wish one of the others had survived <laughs> you know <laughs> you, sort of like, you, you, you sort of have... did ask that didn't you yeah i did i did yeah, but did. Yeah, i was kind of halfway through asking it it was like it's like <laughs> i don't mean to say chris is really boring but um yeah you know um you you, know, you obviously neil is a much more interesting character than chris is and even yeah even Mike with Tom Sizemore's performance in my head. I mean, I think he makes a lot of a, what well, probably on paper is a pretty nothing role, you know? Um, but yeah, Chris, Chris doesn't strike me as the guy in the crew who you would go, Oh, I really want to find out what happens to him in, in a few years time. Um, yeah. But they sort of, I think she manages to pull it off. I mean, I, it, and I did like the Paraguayan sort of the Chinese, the international, the interzone of this. Well, what what Britain is going to be very soon, uh, sort of like regulation free, feral capitalist. Free do what, zone. do what exactly, do what you like, and you know, as long as you don't kill anyone too important, we won't yeah. pay any attention. You know. Yeah, absolutely. You're going to be living in a Michael Mann novel, and and I guess that um, the the fact that that stuff was set um what, how many years are, was it was it 2000 i think that, that it was like five years after the events yeah. of, of heat wasn't it um, yeah and Nin 99 so 2000 it, yeah so so still quite far because i think they were talking about the the handover of hong kong which had happened like in quite recent memory then so i think it was sort of a, a, around there because that was 1999 obviously but um I, th I think it was 99 but um uh, so it's still in the past, you know, we haven't jumped forward that much. And um, I guess, you know, I understand the, the, the reason why you were thinking that, but obviously they very much are able to have their cake and eat it because they, they can have a, a side story with Neil and the crew on another kind of, uh, and yet it all plays into the story of this very big bad who is, you know, one of the most evil characters that I've, it, I've read about in a thriller for some time, you know. Just... He's pretty horrible. I mean, he's ah, he, is, he is a little bit, I mean, this would be one of my, again, sort of mild criticisms, is he, he feels a little bit like a replay of the character in Heat, in the, you know, the, the character in Heat who's kind of the... The, the person who Neil goes back to shoot in the end, you know, I'm, I'm talking to a dead man on the telephone, you know. Yeah. Um, it, it has a similar sort of penchant for, for beating up and killing women and, um, and misogyny. And it's, I mean, that that to me feels a little bit like a cheap, cheap trick. It's a little bit like the Silence of the Lambs. You know, here, here's a villain that you can hate and here's a villain you can love, you know. Mm. And... Um, it's it's it sort of sidesteps your moral qualms about you know about liking Neil, even though he shoots people, unarmed men in the very first scene of the movie. You know, but at least yeah. he doesn't beat up women. He's got a code. You know, right, right, right. I think we've we've come on a, a, a ways since those kind of conversations almost didn't take place except perhaps among you know in in sort of criticism almost mm. um, and sort of film analysis it's like you, you didn't delve too deeply into those things but i think television has really done a, a a great job of making us look at you know from all sides the the the, the nuances of of kind of heroes and anti-heroes and villains or whatever it's like I guess 
in the late you know not from from 1999 i think when again you know when um, the sopranos started it's like every time you you started to love tony just a little bit too much he would do something incredibly despicable to mm. remind you that he's the bad guy you know he's not the guy that you're supposed to be rooting for and then when you get you sort of fall under the spell of someone like let's say you know kim wexler in in not even saul goodman himself or jimmy mcgill or whatever when you fall under kim wexler's spell and think like oh you know i hope this everything's all right at home and everything with these two because they're you know and then you just realize oh my god wait a second what what's happened to my moral compass <laughs> despicable despicable people you know like watching seinfeld and laughing at everyone and forgetting that these are like literally the worst people you know? <laughs> i want to hang out with these terrible terrible people but i think you know michael mann comes from a time when when it was sort of all right to have um a character like that that, that you that that is that evil like the scorp like scorpio in in dirty harry or whatever yeah. it doesn't have to be anything redeeming but i think we've moved on a little bit so it would have been nice to give him some sort of nuance you're right i mean i mean to go back to what you were saying about michael mann right at the beginning i think it's almost like he reminds me of one of those studios there used to be a, a director i was reading about him in the sort of noir book and he basically ha had this small studio and he had a pile of scripts and what he would do he would give a director or a writer the, the he had 10 scripts and he'd give them it and he'd say okay the last time we filmed this we filmed it as a western go away and do it as a gangster movie and then take the other script and write okay the last time we did this as a gangster movie go and do a science fiction version of it right <laughs> and he just had the same 10 scripts but they just changed the setting and the names of the characters and they'd do it again you know <laughs> um and i think michael mann is that kind of filmmaker where he is he doesn't really have a very broad range of interests. He, he he can in the details. He can get really into the details. But in terms of like the excuse for getting interested in Ferrari or for getting into, you know, you know, interested in. I mean, his most sort of abnormal film, if you like, is The Insider and possibly his best film as well. But it's got exactly the same concerns. It's still about masculine men and the men that they're masculine around the men who are being masculine <laughs> and have to make hard decisions that the women around them, you know, can support or can buckle under or can, you know, but the men yeah. will in the end, the men will be the men, you know? Um, and I, 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 I sort of see that as his, a very defined sort of thing that he does. And you kind of, it's kind of like either you you're on into it or you're not, or you you're on board or you're not. Um, That's why I think of him in, in the same way that I think of like a John Houston or, or a John Milius or somebody like that, that he's just like that guy yeah. and you can't, but, but I forget sometimes that he's not from, you know, the same period as, as John Houston, but he's got those same kind of, that that same kind of interest in masculinity ab about him. It's um, in his it's in his goddamn name. <laughs> it's yeah, my, it's uh, Michael yeah. Mann. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, and yeah. he, he is the absolute apotheosis of that because it's the you know it's the 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 one where where you, I mean the women the female characters in Heat are basically you know women who are who are desperately trying to leave the men basically trying to survive the men they might love them they might have, but they, they they know the men are not interested in them they know the men are not they're never going to be the center of their lives or or even or even allow be allowed to express themselves in any meaningful way so i mean but it still I, gets me every time at the end of heat that he goes after the, the the guy that he's got to go after because I forget that the inevitability of that is nothing to do with what the audience wants. It's everything to do with Neil Macaulay and who he is and what he can and cannot allow to happen. And we've he's been telling us who he is when he says never, you know, but so why am I under the spell and, and forget for a long time thinking that he's going to drive away and get away and all of that? And of course he can't. Of course, I'm the fool for thinking that he ever could step away from that and leave that gestalt kind of unresolved. Yeah, but, on. and it's but Michael so Mann would disagree with you. Off the road, Michael Mann would disagree with you because he would say that's his his downfall is that he leaves his code in that. 
as a professional, he shouldn't give a shit about this guy. He should, he's done his job, he's got his money, out you go and just leave it. Don't care about it. And it's actually that that hate, that's a hatred that he's feeling has nothing right. to do with the job. It's nothing to do with the code. He should be on the plane. He's made his money, make his escape. Oh but it, see. It, yeah. it pulls him back like an elastic band, you know, and he can't, yeah. he, 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 that's his failing. Um, and I mean, on the other side of it, which I think is a very funny sort of flip to the, uh, uh, is is the sort of Natalie Portman scene where where Al, well, it's not very funny, but Al Pacino saved her from suicide and goes into the hospital, and it's, suddenly you get this real world of there's other shit going on in this in these people's lives, and not being attentive, you know, not you know, being Jim Rockford is fine, but it's actually going to, you're going to have a price to pay and other people are going to get her. And the bit where his wife just says, you know, and there's a sort of reconciliation and then his pager goes and his wife just goes, all right, <laughs> off you go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's just like the level of sort of emotional maturity in that scene is like there's and you know there's no way he's gonna go no fuck that guy yeah. I've got, I, I don't need to go after him and it's like you sure you're gonna be okay you know, as, yes. as he's already getting his car keys out <laughs> oh no i'm gonna God, i'm yeah. gonna stay with you you know and it's, yeah you got your car keys in your hand vincent that's quite rare because often you'll see the scene where you where it's it makes no sense it's like when two people who know some something that's happening are talking about it together and they're naming like all of it whereas mm. actually you don't need to do the foundation for because if, if the audience isn't there so the writing that feels real is that kind of thing not the oh my god could just once you put your family for obviously that doesn't you know it now goes with that saying because they've been married that long that it, it that it does it's all unsaid isn't it it's just yeah, you know, it's just there. She knows what he's like, and he knows what he's like, and nothing's ever going to change that dynamic. So, and I suppose in the book there is a sort of you're you're in Heat Two. You're getting like, how did Neil become Neil? How did Neil become the Neil of the of the film? Did you did you find that satisfactory? Did you find did you did you like that part of the of the book? Yeah, I did. I mean, I I was I, I liked the fact that it was sort of jumping around in in time more than I thought I would you know at first I was like mm. oh right I see what the, what was going on here and and I did occasionally sort of get a little bit lost with my with with where I was in the timeline um even though they kind of you know I shouldn't because they make it very clear but um yeah I mean I'm not a big backstory guy I don't need to know how these people arrived at, at, at this place when it's a fully rounded character I I do I don't I'm not one of those people who thinks it's always reductive do you feel a little bit like that that all all you know past is prologue and and therefore can be excised you don't really need that stuff you you're, um, you're in the moment yeah, I, 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 I wish there were stories. I mean, I mean, it's the common complaint these days of things like Star Wars. It's like you know, the the whole point of Luke Skywalker is he's a nobody in the middle of nowhere and he's bored. And mm. and to by the time you get to the umpteenth TV show, it's like no, actually, Ben Kenobi isn't this old guy who's just sitting on his own for twenty, thirty, forty, fifty years. He's actually all the time he's hopping around doing other stuff and having adventures before that, that to me really lessens the power of the original and it takes away yeah. from it. Um, it's not so much that there isn't the point. The problem is a, a story to be interesting has to be extraordinary. And if you're putting it in a universe in which stories are constantly happening, then that's no longer really narrative. It's, it's soap opera, you know, I mean, mm. The East Enders never stops, and there's something. There's a week in which nothing happens that's dramatic. You know, it has. A, you know, people don't fall in love or find out that someone's having an affair or somebody's stolen some money or someone's, you know, having a problem with drink or gambling or something. That 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 has to be happening all the time for the soap opera to, and that's what makes soap operas so you know, perfectly unsatisfactory is that you're never going to, there's never going to be a resolution. There's always going to be something mm -hmm. else. Um, 
but that's kind of that's not how that's not what that's a different thing we go to so i mean the problems i have with any small problems i have with heat too would be sort of things like um you know did they have to be in the same city in chicago at the same time mm-hmm. and that sort of which you know meg explains and says oh it's fun to have them almost meeting and sort of teasing that and you could imagine yeah. in the film sort of having a car pull up just as the other car leaves and think oh they almost yeah. you know but to me <laughs> it's sort of it kind of it not doesn't cheapen it that that's a lesser version that's something that doesn't uh worry me too much but if it had been done a bit, if it had been done, it could have been terrible. Put it that way. It could that could that mm. could have been a problem, and and in the end, it wasn't. Um, and as far as Neil is concerned, I actually think his backstory works probably because of the process uh, that that Michael Mann went through, where he actually wrote these biographies for the first film. Exactly. And, get, and gave them to the actors. So there was nothing which was retrofitted. There was nothing that, oh, he was actually originally a political activist. Mm-hmm. And he, he he worked, you know, with Martin Luther King when he was a young man. And then he got, you know, there was nothing that was, that didn't fit with what you already yeah. knew. And that was, and that was, I thought that was good, you know. Yeah, he wasn't having to sit down and reinvent him from whole cloth, but now fill in all the blanks, you know. Yeah. Like, I, I don't really need to know where you know doc brown came from and if they if disney plus launched a young doc brown series about how he got interested in something you know i wouldn't give a shit even though he's like one of my favorite sort of characters from one of my favorite movies or whatever you know what i mean it's just yeah i find that stuff reductive but not to the point where i'm i want to gatekeep what they can and can't do like some people do but, you know no, it- you won't give me young neil mccauley because i don't want to know how how he got to that place, you know. Well, and, and in this book, you you kind of don't get young Neil McCauley. He's, he's already running, you know, he's having, yeah. a, he's in the middle of a long career, you know. Yeah. And that's kind of refreshing for a heist because the heist cliche is is actually heat one, which is the one last job and then I'm out of here. One big score and then I'm done. Um, and in heat two, he's actually doing one more score and then another score. And then I'm going to actually, I'm in the middle of my career. I'm just going to keep doing them for as long as I want. And so that actually makes it sort of less of a cliche. And it's not, we're not meeting Neil in prison and we're not meeting Neil as a young man under the wing of an older guy. And, and no, the thing you have to do, Neil. Yeah. 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 He's fully formed as, as Neil McCauley or uh, that we know exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You don't see him. You don't see him as a child being dropped by his mother in a hot tub of water and and, and her going, oh, I'm sorry, baby. It's the heat. It's the heat that hurt you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> and everybody turning to the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, it's amazing. And this is what's great. I mean, just to sort of, you know, maybe wrap it up a little bit, there is a great thing about this which every time one of these works it makes you less it makes you more open and less cynical to the next one of these you know which is why because some of our favorite films are remakes Mm. you know we have to be open to the idea and because we've seen great belated sequels and now you know we've we've had um that a, a rare thing which is a you know a a much belated novel sequel to a much loved film and it works it's I, i'll be more open to the next one and and obviously i'm you know i'm going to be disappointed more often than i'm going to be pleasantly surprised but this one was beyond the pleasant surprise it was like it's you know really um captured everything that was gr- that was great about heat somehow with the one thing I thought you couldn't put on the page, which is Michael Mann, you know, yeah. the, the, what he brings to the the screen, that incredible cinematic, you know, visionary mind that he has to make even a story as sort of small as two guys riding around in a car feel somehow as giant as Last of the Mohicans. He said he wanted to do like a small movie that was a lot, you know, after mm. Last of the Mohicans, what have you. 
didn't want to do something as daunting as the aviator but so so he chose collateral instead and yeah he makes collateral feel huge because the backdrop that it takes place against is huge i guess but and the characters are better, larger than life you know just incredible but um i thought that would be a deal breaker the absence of the visuals and mm. yet no they're they're there well here's an interesting last question for you we've had quentin tarantino once upon a time in hollywood the novel the novelization if you like which was much bigger than the film in terms of its scope and everything. We've had Heat and which 2. Which I loved tremendously yeah, as abso- well. Me too, abso- absolutely. And we've had Heat 2. Um, I'm not sure if we've had any any more of these sort of like, you know, we obviously we've got had film directors write books before. Ilya, Ilya Kazan did America, America, and, you know, it's been done. But this could this be a... a who would you like to see next right? A, a novel which film director would you would you say oh i'd love to see such and such you know put out their novel version of an, a film or a sequel to one of their films or oh yeah, I could, gosh it's... yeah i've just thought of one actually yeah. as i asked that oh go on tell me yours and then i'll see if i can think of one i'd love to see um uh, David Lynch to uh, write a novel version of his sort of Ronnie Rockets screenplay. Oh, right. Okay. And that would be a, or just, I don't any, love that. I don't love that. Script, the script, honest, but I'd love to read a novel by David Lynch. Yeah, that would be, that would be something. I mean, we did have like, you know, the secret diary of Laura Palmer written by mm. Jennifer Lynch. And we, we had Mark Frost do his kind of, you know, Twin Peaks backstory things. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it would be interesting to see. Jennifer what, Lynch, what who, who's directing the Dharma as well. It's just in an episode that she did of Dharma on Netflix. Right. Ah, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. She's kind of interesting, interesting director. Um, oh, gosh. What was the film that she made with, um, was it Bill Pullman? Oh, Box- Boxing to... Helena. No. Um, no, I, I it was much later oh, i'd have to look, i have to look that one up you can you can cut that part out um i don't know i mean that nothing comes to mind um i don't know if i'm if i'm would be crying out for a, a follow up to a film that you know that i love that hasn't that that hasn't that hasn't been done but the trick that i think that was missed like big time was um any kind of follow-up to, to sneakers, which is just such a perfect movie. The Phil Alden Robinson, it had an amazing ensemble. And those guys together, the incredible chemistry that those characters had. I mean, the, the you know, characters played by um, uh, David Strathairn, River Phoenix, Sidney Poitier, Dan Aykroyd. I mean, Mary McDonnell, everyone as great as the next, you know, obviously Robert Redford, um, this it's such a perfect ensemble that it breaks my heart that 30 years on there still hasn't been any more sneakers and if there was a guy like the guy I, 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 I'm not a, a huge fan of the Fletch movies but I know they have their fans but if there was a guy who'd written like like when you find out there's like I don't know how many Forrest Gump books there are but there's like a bunch of them you know um, <laughs> if there was, Forrest if Gump out, goes to Africa <laughs> if I found out that Phil Alden Robinson was planning to sort of you know live out his twilight years writing sneakers sequels oh my god you know I would just eat those up I wouldn't necessarily need to see them made as films but just that would be that would be the thing that I would I would do if I could. That would be the parallel universe that I would live in. You You'd know? like but then to live in the universe. They might have made a fourth Back to the Future film, and and then obviously I'd have to destroy uh, the universe that I lived in. So, <laughs> you know, I, I'll stick with the universe I've got. If I if I could, even if I can't have uh, follow up sneakers movies or you know a sneakers TV series, just the best ensemble. You know, I've I've, of all. I've never seen sneakers. Oh my gosh! Okay, that's two Blu-rays I've got to send you then. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are they they 
If you have a if you have a Region B player, you'll be you'll be fine as long as you've got you've got a European player. So yeah, 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 good. yeah. That one we had to license properly, but yeah, I love it so much. It's not I'm not plugging it for the for Plumeria, I promise you. Oh, oh, plug away, plug away. Um, <laughs> it's just when you mentioned the cast, it was so brilliant that you mentioned it kind of in reverse order of the poster. I could kind of see the the people get it from <laughs> small to big. And then Red yeah, I started, the, I started Heat with Tom Noonan and worked my <laughs> yeah. way up to Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. I was thinking, who's what's Tom Noonan in Heat? <laughs> I remember the guy from The Simpsons. I remember Apu, yeah. the voice of Apu from The Simpsons. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Hank Azaria. Yeah. And, of course, John Voight in Heat when he was... Uh, when he was still sort of like, well, before his his sort of politics were more famous. I think his politics were, were already swinging well well right at that point. Yeah, he wasn't, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he's he, he's phenomenal in that as well as Nate. Brilliant, David. That's well, that's absolutely absolutely great. So so he oh, and and surveillance was the word, or surveillance was the was the Jennifer Lynch movie I'm thinking of with ah. was Bill Pullman and Linda Fiorentino. I want to say yeah, well, that all- sounds right. That sounds yeah. Linda Fiorentino had sort of one of those strange careers where she was really huge with the last redu- the last seduction, mm. and then she did a few films, but never quite sort of like. Uh, I don't know. I mean, kind of. I, I I imagine had a very long career afterwards as well, but didn't have a sort of that leading. You know, she didn't break up into the Sharon Stone territory, or the mm. you know, or the 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 real sort of we can open a movie with this person's territory. Yeah, I mean, she she withdrew for 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 reasons which weren't necessarily as clear then as they might be now looking back ah, right uh, okay. and i email her regularly through her website lindafiorentino.com i think trying to say when you do an interview you know and and look back on that career because she did have an amazing you know she was one i mean she was one of the not to go too too far down the rabbit hole but let's just say she was one of the actors who was potentially labelled as being difficult because she wouldn't necessarily play the game that, uh, you know, uh, that some would. And we thought of it at the time very differently than we might do looking at it through a Me Too lens, right. let's say. Right. And I think that's part of the story there. So, um, but, but uh, you know, I've, I've no proof of that other than my own sort of gut feeling and the way that things sort of went down and also facing my own prejudices about, you know, actors who were labelled difficult, you know, and, right. and looking at the, the reasons why those might have occurred. So I think there's probably an interesting chapter of an interesting book, which, you know, somebody will hopefully write at some point, which will be looking at the, at the careers of people who, kind of opted out of the system and and hopefully those people will sort of track um you know that person whoever it's me and god i hope it's not going to be me hope someone else does the work <laughs> so i don't have to, i want to go and write another book about movies that never got made you know and, and hope heat two isn't in it and <laughs> yeah I, I wanted yeah i wanted someone to do that with my twilight zone book that's uh, I, I keep I, I want someone to get lawyered up and do that that's the uh <laughs> that's that's got to be that's got to be a great book if you can if you can do it what, what's your twilight zone book well twilight zone the movie the you know um oh the, yeah you're the, right. the making of i just that story uh, there's been some good sort of documentaries and in turn not documentaries but sort of like um episodes of sort of movies from hell sort of thing yeah yeah but but i think it could either be a feature film documentary or one of those netflix sort of four-parters or something like that but it would just be such a a legal quagmire but i think it's there it's so many people are responsible for that for that going wrong that never really uh who never really got blamed properly. And the, the, the people like the helicopter pilots sort of uh, all ended up killing themselves because they were so guilt-ridden and they, they got all the opprobrium sort of thrown on them. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. And I, I think it's one of those things where the um, the more, like you, you know, I have delved quite deeply into that. And the more that you, that you delve into it, the murkier it gets and the more people you love it touches and you know it becomes very hard to separate the the artist from the 
from the horror show that that sort of became and who enabled co-signed it and and were sort of accessories after the fact in a way in 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 you know cut covering all all up and what have you and it's all very much you know part of the course it's, it's what hollywood's been doing since hollywood was invented yeah absolutely you know? But it's just that it's people from that generation of heroes that that makes it hurt all the more. And and yeah, pr pretty, pretty crazy. So, um, yeah, I hope I don't have to write that one, but you absolutely should. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, David. Thanks so much for joining me again. And uh, and but just, uh, yeah, plug your plug your DVD thing. Tell us tell us about that quickly so uh, people can find where oh, yeah. people find so, that. Yeah. So Plumeria Picks, P-I-C-S. .co.uk plumeria spelled like the like the flower p-l-u-m-e-r-i-a pics.co.uk basically we i started my podcast which is an audio commentary podcast because i was afraid that um the the audio commentary was going to die along with the, the dvd you know the, mm. particularly the sort of studio um commentaries and one of the first episodes we did was an was an episode with the director and producer of a peter capaldi film i love called soft top hard shoulder and um, after they'd recorded the commentary, I realized that there was no actual edition of Soft Top Hard Shoulder out anywhere in the world. So I kind of got the rights off the producer, put out a, like a, this is a, like a lockdown project, put out a nice sort of slipcase Blu-ray, learned how to do it. And then thought, you know, when that was all right, I thought, oh, I'm going to do a few more of these. So I collaborated with Simon Brew of Film Stories on a special edition of Sneakers, where we actually actually pony up the money for the license you know mm. got a lovely interview with phil old and robinson for the blu-ray and now we sort of got our next we, we did maze mazes and monsters just came out last monday uh 40th anniversary edition with a lovely um uh cover by phil um oh, the great cover artist i've completely forgotten his name now um uh, sorry about that but um uh, and then we're doing another title, which I think will be out before the end of the year, but I can't actually announce yet. But um, yeah, so I've got this little boutique Blu-ray business and looking for rights for films. And obviously there's massive competition in that area at the moment. <laughs> so we're all fighting over the rights for the, <laughs> for the same films, and, and uh, which is quite fun. So yeah, you've got to sort of snap up the, the good ideas for, because there's a lot of... Um, you know, there's Arrow and Screen Factory, Shout Factory, Eureka, Indicator, Powerhouse, all these guys, they're all sort of fighting over the spoils of the movies we loved as, you know, when we were younger and, and stuff. And, and yeah, so um, you've got to get yeah, we've got a couple of other. You've got to get the big bus, get the big bus. That's a, that's a great. I'm not sure if that's oh, is that not there isn't I'm a Blu-ray of that. I'm not yet. sure if it's available, you know, I'm not sure if it's available. I'll oh. have to look into that. Oh. Yeah. That's a sort anyway, of so plumeriapix.co.uk. And uh, yeah, but we try and do them region free if we can. Mazes and Monsters is region free. It's not always possible because of the licensing arrangements. Right. Um, but um, uh, we do sort of ship worldwide and it's free UK postage. And uh, yeah, so I'll send you a couple of copies and um, hopefully you'll get to finally see Sneakers. And then um, you can get Phil Alden Robinson and persuade him to write Sneakers 2, a novel you're holding up Heat 2 as the perfect... Absolutely. You know, <laughs> the perfect persuasion. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'm right on that. I've got his email. I'll be sending him. Good chatting with you, John. <laughs> Lovely talking to you, David. Take care, Thanks man. Thanks for having me on. Best of luck. Cheers. Bye. Bye. So that was my conversation with David. We had a really good time talking. As you can tell, just enjoy chatting with David any time. And frankly, this podcast is just an excuse to uh, fulfill, to scratch that itch, so to speak. That, that War of the Worlds, David Essex quoting itch that sometimes comes over me. So um, uh, remember, if you enjoyed the episode, to like, subscribe, leave a review, spread the word as far and wide as possible. But... Um, all that remains to me to do is to thank Ellie Atkins for the music, Ellie Howard for the artwork, and thank you, listener, for tuning in. And we'll talk next week. <laughs>